Today we have a, a special uh, uh, guest speaker, Dr. Kaiser Lem, who's a, prof a professor of medicine and uh, a pulmonary critical care uh, physician at the uh, Rochester Mayo Clinic, Minnesota. Chronic cough is not really all that straightforward. This isn't meant to be a session wherein we criticize. This is to remind us of Karl Popper, the Austrian school of philosophy on scientific skepticism. So what Karl Popper said was that our science really does not rest on bedrock. We have assumptions. And as long as the assumptions are reproducible, we stop. And then we build the infrastructure until something comes up again to question the bedrock. So for us in academics, not only are we looking at new knowledge, we're also affirming known knowledge. So as we go down into the deeper layers and things change over time, we need to look at things with a critical eye so that we don't forget what the assumptions are and how good the foundations are. So <clears throat> before we talk about refractory chronic cough, chronic cough is defined as a persistent cough lasting more than eight weeks in a non-smoker, not on an ACE inhibitor. It's quite specific. And the question is, when is it refractory? Well, it has to do with how we define chronic cough. First of all, in any disease states, we look at clinical manifestations with a specific pathophysiology. For example, we know that in heart failure, half of it is systolic, half of it is diastolic. You can have mix and other criteria. But then you have a diagnostic criteria wherein you, know, you have to meet A, B, and C, and you have to have objective findings. And there's a natural course and a prognosis. We may not find that in cough. Cough is a normal protective aerodigestive reflex, and excessive cough is very sub subjective. Early in my career, I had a patient fly all the way in from New York to see me, and when we did our 24-hour pH study, she coughed four times the whole day, and yet it was a problem for her. Cough is a manifestation of a disease state, but it's really not specific you don't have anatomical and structural abnormalities, nor do you have a lot of specific or functional deviations from the norm. In fact, we really don't have a specific pathogenesis and we don't know what the activation of the tussive reflex is. So we go in with a diagnostic criteria. Oftentimes, we don't affirm we can't tell what is causing the cough. And I'll show you the data subsequently. Most of what we do is negation diagnosis, what it is not. So it's great if the test is negative because then you move on to the next one. It's only with eosinophilic bronchitis that we know exactly where it's coming from. We have no clue as to the progression. I've seen people coughing for 48 years, survival, and then there are comorbidities, rib fracture, cough syncope, urinary incontinence. And then in terms of prognosis, we really have no idea too. It's non-fatal. It's a psychosocial stress. Uh, there's a reduction in quality of life. And then aside from the direct injury, you have the indirect, which would be incontinence. Accidents, I had somebody who found, who woke up after fainting in his neighbor's swimming pool. His car had driven past the backyard. He coughed, fainted, boom, ended up in the swimming pool. So a lot of these are, are, are indirect. <clears throat> so the definition of cough basically is clinical. And if you look at where they arrived at the more than eight weeks, it's to eliminate post-infectious cough. So the definition has never been validated. What if it's 12 weeks? What if it's six months? Nobody really knows if the algorithm would be better. And this is by consensus. It started to avoid post-infectious cough, and it has remained there. 
we say normal chest x-ray, but chest x-ray would miss out bronchiectasis. 30% of interstitial lung disease at the start is new. It won't pick up endobronchial growths. So which is better, CT or chest x-ray? And the price difference may not be that high. And yet it has never been studied. How about people who smoke and now have a new cough? There's no data if the algorithm changes. And so we're looking at prevalence of squamous lung cancer dropping, but then people are starting to vape. They put all sorts of things in those vaping uh, solutions. And then how about people with COPD? <clears throat> ACE-induced cough, how can you tell? You stop it, their cough doesn't go away. Is it permissive? We don't do BALs to look for bradykinin, which is suggested to be the, the causative reason for it. And as far as non-infectious, hey, rhinosinusitis, pertussis is making a comeback. You have tuberculosis, and it all depends on the prevalence. So assuming that we're, we're a first world type of situation, our guidelines don't actually apply to a third world center because you can have uh, tuberculosis with a normal chest x-ray. You could be a culture positive chest x-ray negative smear negative TB. So when we look at the popular list that everybody memorizes, upper airway cough syndrome, asthma, reflux, then you have the category of refractory cough and idiopathic. Idiopathic means God only knows. So. It's kind of funny when you look at the upper airway cough syndrome, this is actually the aftermath of a transatlantic war of words. So after the 2006 guidelines for chronic cough came out by the ACCP, the British said post-nasal drip is an American invention. The rest of the world doesn't have it. And so there's an editorial in Lancet criticizing the, uh, the uh, expert panel. And this back and forth led to a compromise of calling it with another nebulous name like upper airway cough syndrome, which then would be postnasal drip, sinus disease, and silent postnasal drip. I really don't think it's an improvement. And then there's the fidelity, because the recommendation of the ACCP is a first generation antihistamine and a decongestant. Most of my patients are older. They can't tolerate the decongestant. And what we do at Mayo is we do scopes. We look for preformed mucus. And then the CT sinus is their gold standard for rhinosinusitis. Asthma turns out to be quite easy for us because we have a lot of tests. So one of the first things that we looked at was exhaled nitric oxide, looking for bronchial epithelial damage due to eosinophilic bronchitis. And it predicts response to inhaled steroid. And I'll show you the data in a while. <clears throat> Reflux is a challenge like everybody else. PPI trials have been shown not to help to be helpful. There is no Medication right now approved for transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. You see, I said that very fast. Motility agents is a bit of a problem. The yield from EGD and probes are questionable, and I'll show you the data for that. Finally, refractory cough is persistent cough despite best treatment attempt, <coughs> which makes it very, very subjective. First of all, there's accuracy of the diagnosis. A lot of primary care physicians don't do lung function. They, a lot of places don't have ENO. They don't look at sputum eosinophil. There's fidelity to treatment. A lot of people use Montelukas and the second generation, and that has never been shown to work. And treatment endpoints. I've seen patients on Advair for five years, and their cough is still there, and they're being labeled as cough variant asthma. So idiopathic, everything comes up negative, but what did you actually do? Did you have a CT sinus, a CT chest? Did you have an impedance? Did you have the breathing test? It's not defined. The rigor isn't there. So when you look at chronic cough and you start looking at refractory, 
the foundation isn't very firm. So if you look at upper airway cough syndrome, it's a self-reported sensation. They go <coughs> <coughs> And the most popular combination from primary care is Montelukas and the second generation antihistamine, which has been proven to not be very helpful. So the original article by, by Sheldon Spector had nine patients in the intervention and six in the control. Two subsequent larger ends did not support this, but you know, Merck took it on the road and every primary care in, and, and his cousin is prescribing Montelukas. Allergic rhinitis, these are what we call the sneezers. It's up front, they sneeze, they itch, they run. And this is easy. We have our own triple nasal spray wherein it has diphenhydramine, ipotropin bromide, and mometazone. And it will also address the non-allergic rhinitis, which are 40% of people with rhinitis. They are obstructed, they have post-nasal drip, and then they react to barometric pressure, changes in humidity, temperature, and particulates. And then chronic rhinosinusitis, the biggest predictor is prior surgery, abnormal CT sinus, and when you scope them, you see purulent secretion. And of course, then there is a directed therapy for this. Reflux is a bit of a challenge. Some people would put it there because you can get pepsinogen from otitis media, pepsinogen from the post-nasal drip. But then we're forgetting that people with sarcoidosis of the nasopharynx would be like that. There's a thorn-walled mucus retention cyst that can cause that. And recently, we've seen funky cases like laryngeal growth. There was even a case of a blastomycosis uh, specific to the larynx. And it's specific to the diagnosis. So upper airway cough syndrome is a wastebasket. I mean, you invent a term. You fit everything in because you want to avoid uh, the British uh, criticism that post-nasal drip does not exist and it's an American invention. Eusophic bronchitis is easy. You do your spirometry to detect obstruction because if you have reversible obstruction, then you're meeting one of the criteria for asthma. And people often confuse cough and wheeze. The pathogenesis is different. Wheeze is bronchospastic. It's in the smooth muscles. Cough is a neurogenic source and it does not involve the muscles. So in people with bronchodilator response, you'll have a 25% short-term response to albuterol. It's not sustained. 19% of people with bronchodilator response will have a methylcholine challenge positivity. A lot of them with negative bronchodilator response would actually have methylcholine challenge. Methylcholine challenge may be a reflection of the permeability of your epithelial lining so that the medicine goes and, and affects a smooth muscle. So beta-2 adrenergic receptor is not antitussive. You will find out later that placebo is really very good. It's up to 45%. Cough and bronchospasm affect or have different mechanisms. And most cough variant asthma are not bronchodilator response. When you do your methylcholine challenge, you exclude asthma. You do not exclude non-asthmatic eosinophic bronchitis, which is why early in our practice, we showed that methylcholine challenge is a poor predictor of inhaled corticosteroids. The likelihood ratio does not change. And this is why we introduced exhaled nitric oxide where in the likelihood ratio of the cough going away with inhaled corticosteroids is 5.8 compared to this. So we actually don't do methylcholine challenge as a pretest for cough because one is a negative data, the other one is a positive data. And the prednisone trial, which is advocated by uh, some cough experts is interesting, but what happens when you stop it? So, GERD is the most problematic for us. If you read the literature, the prevalence is between 30% and 55%. But 
how do we approach GERD? So here are some of the questions that we formulated. Is cough on a severity spectrum of symptom generation? Do you start with silent reflux? You have globus, then you get cough, heartburn, volumetric regurgitation, and aspiration. Does the nature of the refluxate matter? If it's acid, non-acid, or weakly acid? And is the mechanism distension of the esophagus or is it acidic mucosal damage? Is there a temporal relationship? Does the reflux precede a cough or does the cough cause a reflux because you increase your intra-abdominal pressure? So what are we reading when we say there is a statistical association probability based on a two minute window? Does cough cause reflux? And what is meant by silent reflux? And also, does nocturnal reflux predispose to cough? Because you have established neurogenic damage and you have created a chronic pain uh, model in your human per, uh, patient. So I love this paper. This is the Diamond Study. It's by John Dent, came out of gut. And it's one of its kind. So a positive test is by definition, the presence of reflux, pH of uh, less than four in more than 5.5% time, a positive statistic, uh, symptom association probability, and esophageal pH of less than four with response to PPI. And what they did was they Enrolled patients have a family practitioner uh, look at the questionnaire. Then the patient is referred to the gastroenterologist. They do a pH monitoring. They scope them. Then they put them on placebo to see what happens. And after the washout and run, in, they put them on uh, isomeprazole. So one of the things that you find in looking at acid reflux is that symptoms don't help. GERD is present in only 40% of patients and reflux or regurgitation in nine. In the non-GERD negative by a pH study, it's there in a third. And regurgitation is present in 6%. So your symptom doesn't really differentiate. Your questionnaire really didn't do that much. Your general practitioner did just as well as your GI guy. And when it comes to the probe and EGD, 38% were positive for the, for the scope. In Jacqueline Smith's, I'll show you that it was only 20%. So you're getting normal studies four out of five in terms of the, in terms of the uh, scope. Presence of a hiatal hernia didn't make too much of a difference. And most of the uh, esophagitis were mild with LA grade A and B only. And so <clears throat> with the PPI trial, 14% improved with placebo. 35% improve in people without GERD <laughs> as a placebo. And half of people with reflux improve. What does it tell you? A PPI trial doesn't tell you squat. And yet we still do that. Every patient and his cousin with cough gets a PPI trial. So the sensitivity is low, the likelihood ratio is low, and so a PPI trial really doesn't help. And if you look at the symptoms that respond, it's all as associated with acid uh, component of the reflux. That's why <clears throat> when you look at People with non-erosive esophagitis, and you look at the acid exposure and their symptom association uh, probability, normal acid, positive symptom association of 95% or more, it's 1%. So that's good, just background noise. Abnormal acid exposure and positive symptom association probability, 9%. Not very good. Normal acid with no symptoms, 18, that's what we want. 
acid exposure but no symptoms. What does that tell you about our SAP, which our GI colleagues tout as a way of, of uh, ruling out reflux and cough? Not worth much. In people with erosive esophagitis, the data is not that much better. That's why we're in this space wherein there's a lot of opportunity for research. The only difference is that to do a prospective study requires large numbers. And you know, paying for pH probes and impedance probes is uh, pretty expensive. That's why the Montreal consensus was revised and cough and chest pain are not really good in terms of response to acid suppression. And symptom generation is pretty low. So here's a, a study from 2007 when impedance first came out. I remember first time it came out, it took us six hours per study. And uh, now it's automated, it's, it's very easy. But um, Dan Seifrim from Belgium took 100 patients with chronic cough. And he studied them mostly off PPI, 23 were on PPI. And he found out that a lot of the patients with normal acid have symptoms. A lot of the patients have non-acid exposure and weekly acid. So this kind of change in terms of how we were doing things, instead of just pH probe, we started doing impedance. So when I told the group earlier that pulmonary accounts for 20% of all impedance studies. It's because of asthma and GERD and, and cough and trying to figure out what happens. What's very important is this figure over here. Normal, no symptoms, but the patient cough with every reflux episode. This is why they called it the hypersensitivity. And it opened up a new possibility. Maybe what you have is you predispose the system to sense what is normally biologically within normal limits. And this is uh, Jacqueline Smith's paper. She did something nobody else did before. She had a simultaneous acoustic cough monitor. And so she was picking up cough during sleep, which nobody else did. The other thing that she did was she started looking at, at the relationship between reflux and cough. In your symptom association probability, you take the data, you chop it into two minute windows, and you say, within this two minute window, was there cough and was there reflux? But people never looked at whether reflux preceded the cough or did it come after the cough? And you will find that it does both. So cough can cause reflux. This is why your SAP is going to be diluted. That's why it doesn't have the kind of power to tell us what's going on with the patient. And unless you go in and physically look at every study, your SAP isn't going to be all that helpful. She found out that 80% had non-erosive esophagitis. So for, from a cost effectiveness, every community GI guy, when they see Patients with cough, first thing is they scope them, even though four out of five studies will be normal. And so the other question is laryngopharyngeal reflux. In cough, the upper esophageal sphincter may be more important than the distal. So from the ENT and pulmonary point of view, the distal is interesting but the upper may be more interesting because that's where you have the pharyngeal exposure. So in essence, based on a lot of the cough specific studies and from the diamond, non-acid associated symptoms are poor indicators of, of GERD. If they don't have heartburn or volumetric regurgitation, PPIs aren't gonna help. Upper endoscopy has poor yield in cough. Your symptom associated probability is not all that helpful. PPI trials are not helpful because of the placebo effect. And the pH impedance is another rule out. 
So when we say, is it on the spectrum? I don't think so. Does the nature of the refluxate matter? We don't know. Is the mechanism of cough generation the same? Probably not. One of my colleagues thought that it may, it may be due to esophageal dilatation. Temporal relationship between reflux and cough event? Yes, it's an important one. And cough does cause reflux. That's why your SAP isn't that good. Silent reflux happens. These are people who are asymptomatic. So the question is, why are we treating? And then does nocturnal reflux predispose to cough generation? We don't know because there has been no clear studies on this. So when is it refractory chronic cough? When the patient continues to cough despite the clinician's best effort. This is the kiss of death for any clinical trial. When you have such a nebulous definition, and you will see that in a few minutes. Fast forward, we start talking about antitussive. You can't figure it out. They're still coughing, but you still have to treat. Earlier this, this morning, I shared in terms of patient priority. Patient come to see you. They don't care about the diagnosis. They want relief. And so, some patients will say, can't you give me something to help with the cough? And it turns out that this is not a new request. This is a beautiful uh, 1900th century uh, recipe coming from, from the Middle East. And of course, I don't know anyone getting rhinoceros fat or elephant gallbladder. <laughs> to be able to do this. I guess at one point they were very common, but essentially what you're looking at <clears throat> are demulsants, which can be mucilaginous, means that they're, they're, they're high molecular weight compounds like hyaluronic acid, so that these herbs, when you, when you infuse them, they soothe the back of the throat. And then there are the oily base, which is glycerin, peanut base, things that also coat the back of the throat. And then there are, of course, the expectorant, guaifenesin, hypertonic saline, mannitol, which leads to liquefaction of mucus. By the way, guaifenesin has never been shown to work. It's very popular. People use it. But the most recent study by, by uh, Bruce Rubin from UAV <laughs> showed that it didn't work. And it took him six years to get the manuscript out because he was threatened with a lawsuit by the company. That it's a proprietary secret that it didn't work. And then of course you have the more specific mucolytics like DNAs because in cystic fibrosis, it's mostly a DNA from neutrophils. And it does break up mucus in the specific uh, situation. Opiates are big issues. So for example, a third of drug addicted people in the province of Assam in Eden, India, where they, where they, where they track this, it's due to, to antitussive. And in children, this has caused death. That's why the FDA, even after tonsillectomies, will not allow you to prescribe opiates. Lidocaine, we, we, have a, we have a protocol at, at Mayo wherein we did lidocaine, but it's also accompanied by being NPO for two hours before and after. So we jokingly call it the Mayo Clinic diet plan. It turns out that a lot of these drugs, they block sodium channels. And that's how you get the anesthetic. And then there's the first generation antihistamine, and it's thought to act centrally through its anticholinergic effect. And of course, there are herbal and there are no controlled trials for these. So the current approach to chronic uh, cough that's refractory has to do with behavior desensitization. Some patients don't like this. They say, doctor, are you saying it's all in my head? And Ann Vertigan has actually, there's actually a $120 book that they publish. 
and speech pathologies hit or miss. The paper from Lancet looking at gabapentin is very popular, but people forgot that the study went from zero to six capsules in six days. They were adding one capsule a day. So the, the top dose was 1,800 milligrams of gabapentin. So the year it came up, we had the senior author who was the president of the British Thoracic Society, uh, Ashley Wolkoff, come over. And he says, yeah, we don't do that. <laughs> it's just too sedating. At the end of the study, they knew who was on and who was not on the drug because they're zombified. Ann Vertigan and Peter Gibson tried to do the same using uh, Lyrica or Pregabalin, and they were going as high as 150 milligrams twice a day, and it was poorly tolerated because of sedative, uh, sedative effects. <clears throat> the Bastion Clinic, the Voice Institute in Chicago, uses amitriptyline. They push it all the way to 150 milligrams, K-series. They report who, who, who responded. We don't know how many they tried that did not respond. So the nebulized lidocaines are paper looking at the safety and efficacy. So over 50% of people uh, improve with this one, but it's not sustainable because you're nebulizing it. You're actually just physically getting rid of the urge to cough. Baclofen by uh, Peter Dispingitis from, uh, from Albert Einstein. It turns out that baclofen reduces TLESR. So we don't really know the mechanism and his paper was just based on two patients. We're talking about anecdotal medicine at its best. We have the largest series on Botox and we were able to provide 50% relief for 50% of patients, but we can't tell who is going to benefit from it. And so because there's also an operator dependent uh, outcome. So for example, the needle is tipped with an EMG machine. So you know you're in the thyroarytenoid, right? And so Dale Ekbaum, who did the study with us, does a single stroke and inject on the way out. We had somebody else do it. We took him out of the retirement and his technique was jabs, multiple jabs. And the outcome was not as good. So we stopped offering it because you can't pick who and you can't tell if they will respond. It's expensive. A lot of people are so desperate that they would pay out of pocket. But if you can't guarantee the outcome, it's just, it just unethical to do that. <clears throat> We're now trying superior laryngeal block. There are at least two or three groups doing this. But this is again, case series. And so far, the data has not been too good. We use duloxetine as an SNRI. And one of my colleagues is looking at our data. And we're also doing a prospective one. And we're registered with clinicaltrial.gov. Now, I put this because it's the dawning of a new age. And this is going to change how we approach cough. I don't know if it will be in a good way or a bad way. So it turns out that refractory cough may be a neuropathic condition due to central and peripheral nervous sensitization. This goes back to 2007 when they started talking about hypersensitivity of your esophagus. So cough is very com complicated because there's a cough gen uh, cough uh, pattern generator. So as it tra travels up the, the brain stem, it goes through processing and then it goes to three areas. So by the time you're aware of the urge to cough, it had gone to the sensory, the limbic, and the motor. It's so sophisticated that the strength of the sensory perception triggers a commensurately strong motor. And there is a positive feedback. So you would cough and cough and cough until you've scratched that itch. And that's why people faint. They break their ribs. They get into trouble. They have urinary incontinence. And it's that feedback loop 
that reverberates. So people have started using chronic cough and extrapolating chronic pain into chronic cough. So central sen sensitization means that you have novel input that will then start overlapping with your nociceptive pathways. I'll, I'll, I'll show you the molecular basis of that so that it's not just words on the screen. It induces pain hypersensitivity in non-inflamed tissue so that pain is no longer coupled to a particular peripheral stimulus. So there is a field diffusion. So the way they did it is you have an, um, an EMG needle in the uh, dorsal horn and you would stimulate A and this would be the peripheral zone of firing. So A is where you prick. You will see that there is spread and C is far away from the site. The thought process is that when you have a sensitization pathway, you will start engaging. So A is light touch, B is a brush. <clears throat> and in this pathway, you would be applying the stimulus in these specific areas. So you will see the spike, and this is the low fringe, you will see the spike. You apply mustard oil in an area away from where you're stimulating and the whole thing fires off. And so by putting mustard oil, which is through trip A1, you are causing the whole area to be super sensitive. And so the thought was your pharynx, because of reflux at night, because of constant cough, it starts to perceive irritation with biologically appropriate stimulus. Peripheral sensitization happens in the synapse. So you start having upregulation of your receptors. So G protein coupled receptors, your cytokine receptors, your toll like receptors, and then the nociceptors that I had mentioned. You would engage your innate immunity, trigger your adaptive immunity, involve neurogenic inflammation. So it's a cascade. So people have systematically looked at trip V1, look at the overlap. It senses temperature changes in the airways. So if you're breathing in hot air during a fire, you'd start coughing because of trip V1 if it hits a temperature of 40 to 43. If it hits 52, you're no longer going through the C fibers, which are slow. You're going through the alpha delta. It's fast, danger, danger, Will Rogers. Will Robinson, I mean. So if you look at trip A1, it's cold, punctate mechanical stimulation, and hydrogen. This is the wasabi receptor. And uh, trip MB is the menthol, and it's an osmotic sensor. And so what you're seeing is airways, cilia, free nerve endings are on display, trying to protect us from irritation. And so people have started looking at antagonists. And so in the last 10, 15 years, billions of dollars have been spent. And you've gone one through three, four, and systematically you've had a lot of negative studies. So for example, in one of the most recent uh, anti-tussive, Somebody paid $1.25 billion for a compound for cough. That's, that's how big this market is. Adenosine receptor A2 is on mast cells. So when mast cells degranulate in exercise-induced bronchospasm, it's due to A2 sub, subtype receptor. The purinergic is ATP. ATP is not found in the extracellular milieu. Cells have to die, then you release your ATP. So something bad happened to the cell, and this is the way the body picks it up. So people started looking 
at purinergic ATP receptors in terms of nociception and chronic pain. And they found out that, hey, it's also responsible for taste. And I'm bringing it up because the number one side effect of these new antitussive is loss of taste. It turns out that if you knock out both P, uh, P2X2 and P2X3, you don't have taste. But if you, if you knock one out, you still have some of it. So it means that in the natural state, it's usually a heterotrimer. <clears throat> the way they imaginatively envision this is that you have three uh, subunits that come together And so they're upregulated on uh, peripheral sensory motor, uh, sensory neurons. Excessive uh, receptor activation occurs in uh, neurogenic inflammation. And they're associated with release of neuro uh, mediators. And they're also responsible for the taste. So if you look at taste buds, and you see how salt, sour, sweet, unami, and the bitter, they all depend on this purinergic transmission. This slide is a bit of a nerdy thing for me, but the reason why is because if you look at the, the P2X3, homo trimer and hetero uh, trimer, this is what's responsible for the side effect. And if you look at the binding affinity, the higher the molarity means the less affinity they have for the receptor. So the less likely you have to have the side effect. And there's a substantial uh, one to two log differences between the different compounds. So when it comes time for marketing, you are gonna bet that people are gonna highlight some of these changes and <clears throat> this is just a foreshadowing of how you would understand it. So gifapixin was um, submitted to the FDA for approval and hasn't been approved because of the data. So COF-1 is a 12-week study wherein they were looking at two doses, placebo 15 and 45. Baseline COF was 20 COF an hour based on a COF monitor. Placebo improved by 55%. Gefepexant improved by 61%. It's an 18% improvement. And you say to yourself, what happened? Now, having seen the previous slides, do you wonder why? It turns out that when they were doing the small studies, they were going to specific cough centers. When they were doing this big study because of large number, they were opening it up for everybody. So suddenly you have an asthmatic who coughs and they're refractory chronic cough. So it's all the labeling. Now the question is, why did they improve? I think part of it has to do with what we call the Hawthorne effect. When you're coming in for a clinical study, and they say, what meds are you taking? And I say, oh, I'm on inhaled steroid. I take it twice a day. Because you're being monitored, you start taking it the way you're supposed to take it. That's why a lot of the so-called refractory cough getting be better may be due to that. But this is why it's hung up in the F FDA. You have a 55% placebo effect. Taste placebo 3%. With the medication, 58%. And this is within three months of using it. COF2, which is a 24-week uh, study, and a baseline of 19 cough an hour, had almost the same finding. This is a major flaw in the study. And this is why there is a delay. But it's expected to be approved by the end of this year. And you know, at $1.25 billion, this is a high price tag. 
the taste is going to be an issue. This is going to be the first one to hit market. And when you start using this, you have to be aware what's refractory chronic cough. In terms of your institution, the group that sees chronic cough may need to define this because now you have new therapy and people are gonna come knocking at your door and you have to decide what's the minimal workup before patients are going to be put on this because the prior authorization is gonna be crazy. This second drug is more promising. It's a Canadian company and they were able to have a 34% placebo adjusted reduction and because of the binding affinity, the taste issue was less than 10%. So this is the ME2, and there's a ME3 and ME4 that are coming, which would probably be more interesting for us as trialists. Now, part of the problem with phenomenology, which you've been hearing about, and you're realizing how murky chronic cough is, is that we always say it's due to this because this happened after that. And I would say you have fiction, nonfiction, and too close to call. I think, I think we're still here. <laughs> I don't know. The models do make a difference. Right now we're looking at chronic pain as a model. What if it's an itch? The behavioral response to pain is avoidance. The behavioral response to cough is to scratch it. You go, <coughs> <coughs> you're scratching it. There's also a hierarchy of nociception and the pattern integration is going to be different and I'll show you in a minute. So when you model machine learning, First layer is an and, or, and not. And some of these receptors are integrator receptors. You have to have two or three present before it fires. You have to stimulate the node. So if you don't have three of the input coming in, it doesn't fire. At the same time, they block each other. So you have equal, not equal, greater than, or equal. So a lot of these things are not known. And so a single modality in terms of looking for the neurotransmitter is probably um, over optimistic. But the beautiful thing from my point of view is it introduces something for us to dissect. So that who are the ones who don't respond, who are the ones who respond, and we are slowly peeling away the myth and myth and hopefully at some point, now for the first time we have pharmaceutical dollars going into this, we're now able to have more objective findings. I always, I used to tell people that in the past 23 years, there have been no NIH funding for chronic cough. And then I had to correct myself. The asthma consortium actually had a clinical trial looking at zinc acetate for chronic cough. And it was headed by Johns Hopkins, which was a negative study. And none of the people in the trial were cough experts or, or, or in any of the cough committees. And so I have to revise myself. So now there is one NIH funded study that's negative for chronic cough. And so with more pharmaceutical money coming in, I hope that we'll have more clarity over, over this issue in the future. So in summary, we define what refractory chronic cough is, why it's a problem. We reviewed the three most common causes of chronic cough, issues and treatment. We looked at <clears throat> available therapies. We look for the modeling using chronic pain. And what we talked about the new non-narcotic, non-habituating medications. Thank you. Can you tell me more about your Mayo Clinic triple 
nasal spray with the Benadryl, hypertrophium, and steroid, and for the non-entity of post-nasal drip, or are you are you using it for general post-nasal drip, or? So it was specifically uh, formulated because of several problems. So if you look at the commercially available, oh, um, she wanted to know about the uh, Mayo Clinic triple nasal spray. So if you look at the general formulation of nasal sprays, each actuation is vertical. And radio labeled study shows that half of it stays in the inside of your nasal vestibule where you have squamous cell rather than ciliated. So it stays here the whole day and it doesn't go beyond. So our formulation has to do with a, a horizontal delivery uh, device. So the mometazone is a decongestant and a steroid. The diphenhydramine is a first generation, minimizing the sedative effect. And the epitropium bromide blocks cholinergic transmission to the goblet cells. And it's, it's coming in a volume that will reach the back and has been very effective in post nasal drip. I, I hold the formulation. How can we get it? <laughs> I can send you the formula. I mean, Mayo tried patenting it, but uh, I can there's send you the formula. System. There's a delivery system <clears throat> difference as well. Yeah. So initially, we were using an amber colored ENT bottle, but the price kept going up, so the bottle itself was over $80, and a lot of our patients can't afford it. And when you tell them to mix themselves, the, the, the actual reagents come up to 250 bucks. So we use a disposable one, and we, we were able to bring the cost down to 10 bucks. But you know we charge extra for non mayo employees, so I, I don't see a penny. Of it. It's 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 under a hundred dollars, but I don't see a penny of it. So so it's it's the number one product of our pharmacy. So if you want, I can so I can, can give ordered, you the formula. It can be ordered from your pharmacy. No. no. Part of the problem is that there's a difference between manufacturing as a compounding. Yeah. So the minute you order it from us, we're manufacturing it. I see. And the FDA will not approve it. Oh, so you just you need to find a compounding pharmacy. Right. So so it used to be they would dispense it directly. Now they mail order it to the patient. There's just so many FDA regulations. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. Because this was fantastic talk. I've learned a lot about chronic health, something that is not encountered practice. I've got two questions for you. One is uh, it relates to quantification of neurogenic symptoms like cough. How important is that or how much does it weigh into your decision making as far as testing and treatment and also in relation to clinical trials? I've noticed some of the data presented includes quantification of cough um, for clinical trial purposes. The second has to do with design and conduct clinical trials where you have a placebo um, response of about 50%. So what would be the best clinical design that would have an effect size that would be that size of the placebo effect? So the first question is assessment for the presence of neurogenic inflammation in chronic cough. And the second one is how to mitigate a large placebo effect in a randomized controlled double-blind trial. So. The neurogenic inflammation is, it was very hard to quantify. So one of the first things I did was I started suctioning out post-nasal drip, and we actually assayed it for calcitonin gene-related peptide. And at one point, we wanted to turn it into a point-of-care testing. And <clears throat> Mayo Lab even approached Upjohn for, for a single-use slide, but the problem is in terms of prioritization, it never came anywhere. It never went anywhere. And so right now, the neurogenic inflammation theory is something you wave around. But whether it's true or not, you know, I haven't drank the Kool-Aid yet. So, so it is there, but there hasn't been too much proof 
except once these medications start to work. So now people are, are looking at uh, uh, NKA antagonists that you use for migraine and as well as CGRP antagonists for, for migraine and anti-nausea and looking at cough. So the way we're able to dissect this, I think it will be more interesting. As far as the placebo effect, part of it has to do with the definition of refractory cough. Because if you open this up to people who normally do COPD and asthma, anybody who coughs becomes a refractory cough. And the difference in the outcome we're in for the small studies when they keep it in areas where in it's a cough specialty center, the placebo effect was under 30%. It's when they generalized it and opened it up to everybody that the enrollment became a bit of a challenge. So I think that's the problem. And, and you could mitigate that by, by being stricter in terms of your, your recruitment and where you run the study. Because there aren't that many places in the country that will say they're a chronic cough center. It's, it's considered the fibromyalgia of pulmonary. And so most people will avoid chronic cough. And suddenly you have a clinical trial, you don't have a patient base. Do you have a question? Do you okay, think the, you the, the definition of GERD, is that part of the actual definition of GERD? Is that part of the problem in applying, trying to find out if treatments for GERD will help reduce cough? So we always look at the, the initial Montreal consensus of GERD, wherein, <clears throat> as you know, the number of uh, reflux events and episodes and the duration of exposure that has been defined for esophagitis. For the extra esophageal manifestation of reflux, there hasn't been any validation. There has been no study wherein you look at the utility with cough and any of the studies. So, so the original pH study was validated based on esophagitis. That's what the, Tom DeMister <clears throat> did. And this was back in the 1970s. And so the correlation was very tight because the esophagitis was acid damage. But if you don't know the mechanism for globus, you don't know the mechanism for sore throat, hoarseness, and cough, <clears throat> That's why the Montreal or the Lyon's consensus limits it mostly to the esophageal manifestation and not the extra esophageal manifestations. <coughs> I hope that answers your question. Yeah. 